Welcome to Stable Sort. In this episode, we're going to talk about a data structure called Segment Tree. We'll discuss what it is and how to use it, and then we'll step through a source code of a particularly efficient implementation, both in terms of running time and the space requirements. Segment Tree is a data structure that facilitates fast range queries such as finding the sum across a range of numbers. If you've seen our previous episode on Fenwick trees, you can think of it as a bigger, fatter cousin to the Fenwick tree. It uses up more space, but along with summation, multiplication, and XOR operations, it could also do things like find the minimum and the maximum across a range of numbers. As an example of real-world need for such a data structure, Suppose you like to count the number of chickens that cross the street. So you spend years just sitting on your porch and counting them chickens. And now you'd like to know what was the maximum number of chickens that crossed the road in, let's say, January of 1995? Or what was the maximum number of chickens that crossed the road during the last six months of 2019? To answer these types of questions quickly, you store your data set in a segment tree. If you have the numbers simply stored in an array, then to find the max, you'd have to iterate over every element in the array in the desired range, which is a linear time complexity operation. One possibility to speed up this operation is to create a two-dimensional lookup table and pre-compute the max between every possible date range. Looking up a value will certainly be fast, but this may not be feasible to implement for large datasets since the space requirement grows quadratically with the size of the array. The segment tree avoids this problem by calculating the max for only a specific set of ranges, but it's done in such a way that you could still find the max over any range in order log n running time. Here's how it's done. Suppose we have an input array with these numbers. We'll start off with an array of length 8, which is a power of 2, to make the example easier to follow. But later on, you'll see that the algorithm works for any size array. We now compute the max between each sequential pair. So the max between 6 and 10 is 10, the max between 5 and 2 is 5, and so on. Once we're done with the first level, we repeat the operation for the next level up, and so on until we find the max across the whole array. Now, if you'd like to know the max in the range of, for example, index 0 to 5, then you just need to walk up the tree to the nodes that cover this range and check the values between just those two nodes. In this example, the max is computed for values 10 and 7, which is of course 10. So how do we construct this tree? It turns out we don't actually need tree nodes with pointers. Instead, we can get away with having an additional array that's twice the size of the input array. Let's take a look at an actual implementation written in Java. Here is a function that constructs the tree. The first thing it does is it creates an array twice the size of n and then copies the original array into the second half of it. From there on, it goes from right to left, taking the max value of two adjacent elements. If the input array is of length n, then the running time complexity to construct the segment tree is order n. Now let's check what happens when the length of the input array is not a power of 2. Here's a simple example where there are only three elements in the array. Then the tree will be constructed like so. Visually, the tree ends up being not perfectly symmetric, but that's okay, since the max values still bubble up to the top. The element on index 0 of the tree array always remains unpopulated and can just be ignored. But that's the extent of inefficiency. Unlike other implementations that require the tree array size to be in the power of 2, which may lead to nearly half of the array to be unutilized. To update values in a tree, we follow the same methodology. Start at the bottom of the tree and bubble up the change to the root. As a bonus, we can stop early as soon as we detect that no change was made by the last operation. So the updates take at most order log n running time. A quick side note. 
If the input array is of length n, what guarantees that all of the nodes in the tree will fit if the new array is exactly of length n multiplied by 2? Well, since each row of the tree cuts the number of nodes by half, the bottommost row has n nodes, the next row up has n over 2 nodes, the row above that has n over 4 nodes, and so on. 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth is a geometric sequence, which converges on 1. Here's a beautiful visual proof that needs no further explanations. Going back to the source code, the function that finds the max is also fairly straightforward. As we saw earlier, the bottom layer of the tree is at the right end of the array, and subsequent layers are stored closer and closer to the left end of the array. So the first thing that the function does is it shifts the from and to variables to the right to match the bottom tree layer. By the way, in this implementation, from is assumed to be inclusive, while to is exclusive. On each iteration of the while loop, they are divided by 2, meaning they move towards the left end of the array, or up the tree if you will. The function terminates once the variable from is no longer less than the variable to. So if the difference between those two variables starts off small, then the loop terminates sooner. For example, if you call this function with parameters 5 and 6, which get shifted to index 13 and 14, then the loop will terminate after the very first iteration. The local variable max starts off as the smallest possible value, this is Java's equivalent of negative infinity, and is reassigned as larger values are encountered. Here's a neat fact. The algorithm re-evaluates the max variable only if the index from and to are odd. Why is that? It's because if the index is even, then it's the left child node. We don't need to bother reading it since we'll get another chance at doing it on the next level up. Of course, the same logic applies on the next level up and the decision about even index nodes could always be postponed. Given that the length of the tree array is always twice the size of the input array, which is a constant multiplier, and that on each iteration of the loop the from and to variables are halved, the loop iterates at most log base 2 of 2 multiplied by n, which is an order log n running time complexity. Another way of saying this is, since the algorithm walks up the tree and the height of the tree is equal to log n, its running time is order log n. In the end, both segment tree and fenwick tree are quite similar. Segment tree uses twice as much storage space, but it is able to handle any binary associative operation, while Fenwick tree works only on operations that are reversible. If you'd like to see a tutorial on Fenwick trees, please check out the link in the description. There you'll also find links to source code of both of the data structures. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Stable Sort. If you did, please remember to click up thumbs up button. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching.